Hi there, I'm recording this uh, video for a student of mine, uh, but maybe other people would be interested in learning a little bit more about Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, one of the most powerful political writers uh, in English, sometimes called the mother of modern feminism. Uh, she's also known as the actual mother of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. Uh, she lived in the 18th century. Uh, she was self-taught, and she became the first woman to make a living as a journalist and a book reviewer, um, probably in all of English history. There were other women that made money in literature, uh, many other women, actually, in the 18th century. Uh, you may know of um, uh, Eliza Haywood would be a, a good figure, a person who wrote not, uh, rom romances, uh, in the early 18th century, and then later became a literary critic. Uh, but Mary Wollstonecraft is often considered the first because she had almost no help from aristocrats. That's often the way that people made money, if they made money, uh, by getting subscriptions from aristocrats. Um, and she worked full-time in the book business. And she was able to do that in London with the help of a very innovative and radical publisher called Joseph Johnson. So the, it's a long story of Mary Wollstonecraft. Her most famous book is called A Vindication of the Rights of Women, which is also a first in the sense that it asks, first of all, for equal education and equal uh, treatment in, in public life for women. Uh, so you see I'm choosing words carefully uh, because there are a lot of things she does not ask for that we're more comfortable with in the 20th and 21st century as being uh, you know, definitions of feminism. Uh, but in any case, uh, she wrote the groundbreaking book. It's a very powerful book. It has a lot of new things in it that were unusual in the 18th century. Uh, she, first of all, just a woman writing about politics to begin with uh, in a very bold and direct way. Some people called her a man. So, But she was aware of this and she even in discussing the idea of being considered man or man-like or masculine, she actually started thinking about uh, the concept of gender. She didn't call it gender. She called it a sexual character. So there's a lot of things to her vindication of the rights of woman uh, published in 1792 in London um, that, you know, create a picture of Wollstonecraft as a warrior, a fighter, an activist. And, uh, and she was. But on the other side, was her personal life. And uh, it's unfortunate that her personal life, when people go into it, is something that sometimes they'll, uh, she gets a lot of criticism for. She always has. Uh, when she died at the age of 37, giving birth to Mary Shelley, actually, um, she was actually very popular and very famous as a very respected political writer. You know, um, yes, there's sexism in the past, uh, but, um, you know, the 1790s in, in Britain were a very interesting time. There's a lot of radical movements. There's a lot of people who admired what she did. But once she died and these letters here that I'm about to show you showed up, um, a lot of people, even people who are formerly her friends, turned against her because it turned out that she had a very complicated private life and her character is very different in the letters than in the published works. So um, we're going to go through a couple letters. There's a very famous one uh, written in November of 17, um, 1787, I think it is, uh, when she moves from her various little jobs into London and becomes a writer. It's a beautiful moment in her life. But what the thing with Wollstonecraft, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, is that she always from a young age, really wanted to support herself and her friends and her siblings. She was very motivated to be kind of the center of a community uh, where she could single-handedly help people. And uh, she started working at a very young age. And she's almost in the beginning, she worked at jobs which are not so typical of women when they did want to work. Uh, there were very few jobs available, but she tried to do things that you know gave her a little more freedom. So one of the things that she did was she was a governess, um, but she wasn't a typical governess. She wasn't someone who kind of obeyed all the rules and told the 
kids to clean their noses and, and be proper and make the girls be girls and the boys be boys. She was a very, um, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but uh, she really instilled a sense of independence and, 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 and intelligent inquiry into the kids, especially the girls under her charge. And she worked for a family called the Kingsboroughs in Ireland. Uh, she has some Irish heritage. Uh, she's considered an English writer, but she herself has an Irish Irish um, uh, background on one side of the family. Um, and she was living in Dublin uh, for a very upscale aristocratic family called the Kingsboroughs. And she was very unhappy, but she, was, she liked her job. And the kids loved her. And many years later, the girl that she took care of uh, became a very thoughtful and interesting person and writer. Uh, so she was inspiring from the beginning. So this is 1787. She was born in 1759, which makes her 28 years old. And she's writing to her sister, Everina. And uh, she's writing from Mitchellstown, which is the place in, in, um, in, in uh, Ireland. We're not going to read every little bit of it. I'll, I'll, um, I'll make this available, this document. This is from the great edition by Janet Todd, one of the greatest scholars of Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, feminist professor in in Britain, uh, probably almost single. Not I won't say single handedly, but one of the people who really brought Wollstonecraft into the public eye over many decades. So uh, a phenomenal scholar who published these letters. You notice all the notes at the bottom, and this is because she really wanted to to document these letters and and make sure that we understood all the little nuances in the letters. But I'm looking more for a little bit of the character of Wollstonecraft and just kind of illuminating a couple spots. So, so we, we have a bunch of pages here. I'm just going to do a little bit from each one and then go to the incredible line, the super famous line much later on in the year, uh, 1787, when she changes her life forever and really basically uh, changes English literature in a way forever. So she says, I am not angry with you, my dear girl. Though if you knew the pleasure your letters give me, you would be more punctual. I am here shut out from domestic society. So this is the life of a governess, right? You you have to take care of the kids. The the mom and dad are off at balls and things. And and it was very typical for, for families, not just very aristocratic families, but many families from the middle class on up, although the, the middle class didn't exist per se, um, to not take care of their kids directly. And later on in her, in her career, Wollstonecraft really let them have it about like, why do you farm your kids out? Why do you never nurse your kids? You know, there was a big debate over whether you should nurse your kids directly. Many women sent their kids to be nurses in a different town and they wouldn't see their kids for a while. So this was a big issue, actually. And uh, you could see as a, at a young age, she's uh, she's kind of complaining about, you know, being uh, kind of isolated with the kids, you know, which is a very typical thing for governesses at that time. So, um, but she's also very emotional and she's talking, you know, I can, you leave it up to you to see, you know, what kind of emotion she's able to communicate in this letter. She goes, my heart throbs when I see a hand written uh, by anyone to whom my affections are attracted. I am sometimes so low spirited. I think anything like pleasure will never revisit me. I go to the nursery, something like maternal fondness fills my bosom. The children cluster about me. One catches a kiss, another lists my long name. While a sweet little boy who is conscious that he is a favorite himself calls himself my son. At the sight of their mother, they tremble and run to me for protection. Uh, so you can see she's a pretty beloved person in that household. She eventually loses that job. Uh, I think they want her, but I, if I remember the story correctly, you know, she always was trying to you know, participate more in the full life of these people. and. Um, you know, in the complicated position of governess where she's educating the kids, feeding the kids, and also part of the family on vacations, at parties. And so, you know, a person like Wollstonecraft, who is destined to be one of the 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 the, the giants of uh, women's writing, of any writing, women or not women, uh, you know, you can imagine her locked up taking care of five, six kids, no matter how much she loves them, right? So that's kind of a little flavor there. And notice she's writing to her sister. So her sister, she has two sisters, and they're both people that she ended up taking care of. 
in different ways throughout her life. I told you she was dedicated to sending them money and taking care of them. She actually kidnapped one of them from a very mean and abusive husband. She was a very bold person. So she's kind of sharing her intimate feelings with her Everina. Um, but, you know, she's also very vulnerable. Uh, do pray make a point of writing frequently to me and be very minute in your account of the few people I esteem. I'm a sojourner in a strange land, right? She's in Ireland, the strange land. And like to be reminded that I still live in the remembrance of those. I mean, she's very sappy, very romantic. Some people say she's actually inspiration to the romantics who come about 10 years, 10, 15 years after this is when the, the so-called British romantics showed up, you know, the great poets of the British romantic uh, uh, time. Uh, but this kind of self knowledge this emotional self-talk uh, a little bit self-pitying maybe <laughs> but she's depressed i mean give her a break so um anyway so that's that one and then there's george blood very interesting who's george blood george blood is the brother of her best friend she loves her best friend more than anything or anyone in the whole world uh it's not unusual for women to have a of this time to have a friendship with other women that was so powerful and sometimes verged on, um, it's hard to say whether these friendships were sometimes sexual or not, uh, but the, and this is, you know, these are speculations. Sometimes these kinds of speculations are a little weird. Um, not because there's anything weird about, you know, uh, same sex attraction, but weird in my estimation about trying to guess too much about a writer by what they write. I like to kind of let the text hang out there and, and and have a little humility about trying to judge people by their text, even by their personal texts. I hear these are personal letters that she wrote and she did not want these published. Um, so these were published by her husband after she died. So here we are reading them. I don't know if that's nice or not, but uh, yeah. So anyway, George Blood is the best, is the brother of her best friend, Fanny who she's willing to die for. She loves Fanny so much. Um, she even gives up a very successful school that she starts later in her life um, in order to go to Portugal and uh, and visit her friend who's, who's dying in child in childbirth. And she does die. Uh, and the rest of her life, Wollstonecraft's heartbroken over losing Fanny. She even names her first kid over uh, after Fanny, after Francis' blood. But the reason this is an important letter is just because to show that she is a community. She's about community. And so all the people attached to her, her best friends, her sisters, are people she cares about, communicates with, and wants to help. She helped George Blood in many ways. Um, so she says, my, my dear George, I know um, we'll be glad, probably you will be glad to hear that in the course of a fortnight or three weeks at farthest, he will again see his friend and sister Mary in my way to Dublin, I intend spending a few days in Tipperary. I earnestly wish to see your uncle Bailey to see the place my poor Fanny was so attached to. Right? Oh, so I made a mistake. So this is this is this is after she comes back from Portugal. I shall lay in stock of good news for our mother. Right? That's not her mother; it's the mother of Fanny. But she still says our mother. So this is just a you know these are kind of emails almost, right? Texts because. Uh, letters, you know, a lot of times people think, wow, we have a letter by Shakespeare, we have a letter by, you know, the great poet, you know, John Keats, we have a letter by, but, you know, people wrote letters like nothing in those days. The letters were just a way that people communicated, sometimes over very minor things. Hey, you know, bring me, make sure to bring me my oatmeal tomorrow morning, and they send a letter by a little boy, you know, running down the streets of London and stuff like that. So these are these are not like earth shattering letters. Some of them are, <laughs> you know, because everything went by letters. But a lot of these letters are um, just like the daily life of people kind of communicating with each other. So you'll see all these little details in there. It's kind of fun. Um, so again, Mary Wollstonecraft's super emotional, super touching writing. Your silence surprises me, my dear girl. I had a letter yesterday from Eliza, the other sister, you know, usually pensive strain. And among other things, she mentions not having heard from you. So what's going on with you? Come on, answer my text. You know, <laughs> we have letters later in her life where she writes a, writes a letter and then it doesn't get answered for an hour. And she's like, what happened? 
you know, because she's living down, she's actually living down the street from her husband. They decided to live in separate apartments. So, you know, this is like, um, you know, the age of letters, the age of fast little letters. She's like, what's going on? She didn't answer my letter, you know? Anyway, let's skip over to the famous letter. Uh, this is a, a minister who helped her a lot in setting up her school and connecting her to publishers and getting her work and things like that. He invited, he introduced her to her publisher. And this is the letter that kills all letters because she does get introduced to the publisher in this year, 1787. At the age of 28, she gives up a string of female jobs, you know, teacher, governess. She even takes care of an, she's like a nurse's age, takes care of an elderly woman you know, living in Bath, the famous city of Bath in England. Um, but she gets introduced to Joseph Johnson, who loves her writing. She's already written a novel, kind of as a hobby almost. And he's like, whoa, you're really good. Um, and it changes her life. He just says, look, I want you to write for me. He writes, he, he's a publisher of a journal. In those days, journals were came out like almost every week, every month. And everybody read them. And he, he had a literary journal where people reviewed books. And she got the job and he offered her money for every every review you write will uh, will we'll pay you a little bit. That was amazing. You notice her whole character changes. Again, I don't want to psychoanalyze her, but look at this change of English, change of strength, change of emotion. Though I am persuaded my silence must have given a rise to various conjectures in your mind, my dear girl. Yet I am certain you have already imagined that it was not the effect of negligence or want of affection far indeed from it so how assertive this sounds compared to the, the previous one um little money business here and then comes the line of all lines the most famous line uh in mary wollstonecraft's writing almost more famous than her actual published writing and she says mr johnson this is the publisher whose uncommon kindness, I believe, has saved me from despair and vexations I shrink back from and feared to encounter, assures me that if I exert my talents in writing, I may support myself. I mean, gosh, what a, what a moment that even today, you know, to, to get the job of your dreams, to support yourself with the thing you love and the thing you do so well. I mean, what a moment. And this is a woman whose father was an alcoholic, whose mother was a victim of abuse, whose brothers and sisters were kind of like just hanging on her, you know, waiting for her to make it. Uh, this is a woman who really worked hard. And here she is at 28. I may support myself in a comfortable way. I am then going to be the first of a new genus. In other words, a new species, a new type of person. What kind of person? What new kind of person? It's a woman who can write and makes money from her writing, can express herself, her opinions, her beliefs, and her hopes for her community. I tremble at the attempt, yet if I fail, I only suffer. And should I succeed, my dear girls will ever in sickness have a home. See? The first thing she thinks of is, if I succeed, you and Eliza will always have a home with me. Uh, a refuge. So that's Mary Wollstonecraft. And I leave you with that. I will I will make this available to you. There are a lot of other things to pick from. You can choose your favorite lines. Um, amazing text. I hope this helped in, um, in having an introduction to the other side of Wollstonecraft, not the political side, but the personal side. And I hope that this inspired you to think deeply of the women of the past and uh, how they lived and how they worked and how they thought. A uh, little introduction to that. Um, yeah. Thank you for listening. And I hope to see you soon.